really excited about the sermon today. I've been teaching on this um, sermon series called Beauty from Ashes. And uh, we're looking at six people who had six encounters with Jesus. No one is a lost cause. No one is a lost cause. And so two weeks ago, we, we looked at uh, the woman at the well, and we saw that Jesus goes to those who are um, the social outcast of the day. Uh, two weeks ago, or last week, we looked at uh, the, the story of the demonic man and saw that Jesus goes to the darkest places, darkest places to reach people. And today, we're going to look at this woman who's, who's called a Canaanite woman who uh, Jesus shows us that he'll even go to his enemies, his enemies, because we, we read this story, and of all the six stories, this is probably the, the strangest one. I don't know if anybody's read ahead or not, but uh, we read this story. It's only six, seven verses long, and yet Jesus acts in a way that is uh, unlike typical Jesus. Uh, this poor woman comes up to him because her, her daughter's demon-possessed, and Jesus is kind of cold to her. He, he ignores her first, then he tells his disciples to ignore her, and then he's kind of rude to her when he does talk to her. And you're thinking, what, what's going on with this? I mean, what's going on, Jesus? This is not typical Jesus. And what we want to see, and what I want to show you in this, is that there, is an, uh, there are attributes of God that we must understand. And the, and the attribute I, I want you to understand is that God is both just and he is both merciful at the same time. Okay? He is equally just as he is merciful. His mercy is not one grain of sand heavier than his justice, and his justice is not one grain of sand heavier than his mercy. In fact, they work together. It's almost like two sides of the same coin working together, and you see this all throughout Scripture. You see God operating in a way that's just, in a way that sometimes we don't understand, you know, where he's doling out punishment. You know, when we read about this in the Old Testament, we're thinking, man, what's up with all this punishment? But he always follows it up with mercy. God is equally mercy, merciful as he is just. And so when we read this story about this woman, we see this, these two sides of the same coin with Jesus. We see him acting in a way that's just, and then we see him acting in a way that's merciful. And we have to ask ourselves, what changed from going from just to being merciful? And that's what this whole sermon series, is, our sermon is about. So this is uh, taken out of, this is taken out of, uh, Matthew chapter 15, like I said, this is only seven verses long. So this is the shortest one of the stories. And I actually had a hard time whittling down what I wanted to say because there's a lot we can say about this. And so here's what it says. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Ouch, kind of hurts. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. What in the world's going on? <laughs> Did Jesus really just call this woman a dog? I mean, really? I mean, okay, how do we understand this? A lot, a lot of ink has been spilt, you know, trying to figure this out. What exactly is going on? Of why Jesus was so cold to this woman. And it all has to do with what I told you about. God is both just and he is both merciful. And when Jesus begins talking to her, he's talking from a, a position of justice, which I'll explain in a little bit. And then she says something to him that switches it to where he starts talking to her from a place of mercy. So to understand this, we have to, we have to look at the context. And I said last week that context is everything, okay? If you don't understand the context, then you can really get confused on what scripture says. So we have to understand the context. And so let's start with where Jesus went. It says that Jesus went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. So you can see at the top there, the region of Tyre and Sidon. Those were cities. This was about 60 miles north of Jerusalem. This was a long journey. This is the longest Jesus traveled in his ministry. And for some reason, he needed to get away. So maybe this was like a little vacation. I don't know. But he went way up there. 
he went way up to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he encounters this woman who was a Canaanite woman. And those words right there, Canaanite, Tyre, and Sidon, were buzzwords in first century Jerusalem and to the Jews. Those were curse words to a Jewish person. And that's the context of why I want you to understand. Understand who the Canaanites were to the Jews. Understand who the Tyre and Sidon, that region, was to the Jews. They, that, this was a, these were curse words. This woman represented the enemy of God. She represented the enemy of God. How is that? Well, let's break this down. Let's start with the Canaanites. The Canaanites, if you, if you read in the Old Testament, the Canaanites were a wicked, wicked people. When God told Joshua to kick the Canaanites out of the land of Canaan, it was because of their wickedness. It wasn't because God just felt like he's being mean one day. It was because of their wickedness. They were wicked, wicked people. They worshiped these gods where they did all kinds of wicked things. Uh, I try to keep this PG, but their, their, sexual, their sexual perversions were off the rails. They worshiped gods where they, where they um, sacrificed children in fire. They, uh, they practiced all kinds of black magic. In fact, it says this in Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 11. It says, God speaking to, uh, to the Israel. He says, when you enter the land the Lord your God has given you, which is the land of Canaan, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or a spiritist who, are in cult, who consults the dead. That's just the beginning of the wickedness of these people. They were Canaanites, and this woman coming to Jesus was a Canaanite, okay? I want to give you just kind of a little art, artistic interpretation of this, of what they would do. They worship, they, uh, they sacrificed their children to this, this god called Molech, and he was half bull and half human. And they would light him on fire, and they would put the children in the hands of this statue and, and, and roast these children as a sacrifice. This is wickedness beyond what we can understand, okay? And archaeologists have found uh, the grave sites of thousands and thousands of children all the way up to the age of four, who these Canaanites would sacrifice in the fires of Molech. This was despicable stuff, okay? And one of the warnings that God gave to the Canaanites was to, uh, I'm sorry, one of the warnings that God gave to Israel was to stay away from the Canaanites. Don't intermarry with them, don't intermingle with them, because if they do, they will draw you into this perversion. They'll draw you into this wickedness, and guess what? That's exactly what happened. It says this in Jeremiah, the people of Israel and Judah have done nothing but evil in my sight. They set up their vile images in the house that bears my name and defile it. They build high places for Baal in the valley of Gehenna to sacrifice their sons and their daughters to Molech. Though I never commanded it, nor did it enter my mind that they should do such a detestable thing and so make Judah sin. This valley of Gehenna is a place you can visit today. It's right outside Jerusalem. And this is where they would do these despicable things. And when Jesus talked about hell, he used the word Gehenna. When he, when like for instance, when he said, you know, um, it's better uh, to, you know, if, if, if your eye causes you to sin, it's, it's better to, you know, pluck your eye out than that your whole soul be thrown into hell. He uses the word Gehenna. It's, so the people listening to this understood what he's talking about. This is a place of evil. This is a place of wickedness this valley of Gehenna, where they did all these things. These Canaanites did these things. So let's move on to the, to the cities of Tyre and Sidon. The people in, in Tyre and Sidon, the Canaanites that lived up that way, they had a long history of attacking Israel and, and carrying off people, carrying off their children and, and, uh, and selling them. I mean, wicked stuff. And so God complains about this and Joel he says, in those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will put them on trial for what they did to my inheritance, my people Israel, because they scattered my people among the nations and divided up my land. They cast lots for my people and traded boys for prostitutes. They sold girls for wine to drink. Now what have you against me, Tyre and Sidon, and all you regions of Philistia. 
So this, when this woman, this Canaanite woman from the region of Tyre and Sidon walked up to Jesus, who was a Jewish teacher, she represented to the Jewish people the epitome of God's enemy. The epitome of God's enemy. Any Jewish person in this day would have spat at her, would have said, get away from me, you dog, <laughs> okay? So that is the context of why, we, why we're seeing Jesus talk to her in such a cool way. Because to the Jewish people, the Canaanites from the cities of Sidon and Tyre were wicked, wicked people. And yes, she's, she uh, individually was not responsible for all this, but she was from that heritage. It'd be kind, be kind of like if, uh, if the daughter of a Nazi off officer came up to a Jewish surgeon, you know, a Jewish surgeon, and said, you know, can you come back to my house and help my daughter? He'd be like, whoa, what are, you, what are you talking about? What are you talking about, you know? She represented the enemy of God, and that's what I, the message I want to give to you today. Is that when Jesus spoke to her, he was speaking from a, a, a place of justice. He answered, because I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. In other words, he was saying, my priority is to my own people. I'm not going to put a, I'm not going to, I need a, I came to them to be their Messiah first before I talked to someone other than Jewish people. And the woman came and knelt before him. She said, Lord, help me. She said, he replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and, and toss it to the dogs. I've been, I've been reading a lot of, I, I want to get some explanations on this as to why he called her a dog, okay? And, um, and this is what a lot, just about everybody said. Jesus knew that this woman was expecting to be treated like this. Having her background and what she represented, she fully expected to walk up to Jesus and be treated in this manner, okay? Because of who she was and what she represented. So Jesus is probably testing her in this. He just wants to see what kind of re response she, she gets when uh, a Jewish man talks to a Canaanite woman. And so, and what's so amazing is that her boldness to go up to a Jewish man with all that baggage that she had, that was incredible boldness. So he talks to her from a display of justice, but then the conversation changes on a dime, and she says something to him that switches him from a, a display of justice to a display of mercy. And she says, yes, it is, Lord. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. As I've been studying this passage this week, it occurred to me that what we are seeing in this story is a framework for the gospel of Jesus Christ. What we're, what we're seeing is the DNA of the gospel of Jesus Christ played out in this scenario with this woman. What do I mean by that? It's because she did two things right that are of the gospel. See, this Canaanite woman represents you and I. We are the enemy of God in our nature, okay? We are, by nature, the enemy of God. And this is what she did. <clears throat> she first confessed who she was. Because when Jesus said, uh, Jesus said, it's not right to give the, you know, the bread to the you know, to the dogs, she didn't, she, she, didn't, she didn't argue that, did she? She didn't say, well, who are you, talking, who, who are you calling a dog? You know, she didn't, she didn't say anything other than she said, yes. She said, yes. You're right. Yes, that's who I am. Yes, I know who I am to a Jewish person. Yes, I know I'm a Canaanite. Yes, I know what my people did. Yes, I know the wickedness of my people. Yes, I know the wickedness of this region, what they did to Israel. Yes, I know. She said yes. She confessed who she was. This is what it says in Ephesians 1. He says, uh, uh, says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us, all means all, all of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were nature, by nature deserving of wrath. We are the Canaanite woman, okay? We, we're her, 
Our sin separates us from God. We, we have a whole litany of baggage that we carry with us that separates us from God. That's our condition. That's a place of justice. But God's mercy says this, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's by grace you have been saved. You get a do-over. This woman got a do-over, okay? No longer was it about her past and about her heritage and about what her people did. It all suddenly became about the grace of God because she confessed She confessed who she was. She said, yes, you're right. She confessed. And she also confessed Jesus. Three times she calls him Lord. First time she calls him Lord, son of David. Somehow somehow this woman, 60 miles away, heard about this Jewish teacher who was healing people. And in her mind, she put it together that this must be the Jewish Messiah. And she called him Lord, son of David. Not even Jesus' disciples had come to that point yet. Okay, not even his disciples had come to that. And she confessed that who he was. She confessed her sins, she confessed who she was, and she confessed who Jesus was. That is the gospel, is it not? That is the gospel. We confess who we are and we confess who Jesus is. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That is a promise. That's a promise. If we confess our sins, if we confess who we are, if we confess who Jesus is, Romans 10 says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you profess faith and are saved. Confess who you are, confess who Jesus is, and you go from a place of justice to a place of mercy, just like that. Just like that. Amen? Oh, I love this. Just like that. This woman had absolutely nothing. (laughs) She approached Jesus with absolutely nothing going for her. She was empty of everything. She had all the baggage in the world to approach Jesus, but yet she did it anyways. And that is the message to all of you. So many people believe, oh, you know, I've done too many bad things. God can, can't forgive me. God surely can't love me. But yet this woman approached Jesus in all her worldliness and got grace, and got grace. And so when I started my sermon out this week, I was, this was going to be my main point right here. But then as I studied this, I got to thinking, you know, this is the gospel. This is, this is the gospel. So I'm going to end with what was originally my, this is a kind of a tag on, a little mini sermon here. Jesus said to her, you have great faith. Not just little faith, great faith. What's interesting is that the chapter before this, Jesus criticizes his own disciples for not having enough faith. And here comes this woman and he says, you have great faith. What made the difference? I saw four things. First, she was bold. She was bold. Knowing now that what we know now with, with her baggage and all that she represented, knowing that she was probably going to be cursed at by approaching a Jewish man, she was bold. She put herself out there, didn't she? She put herself out there. I don't know what you are believing for God. Maybe it's, I don't know. Maybe, whatever you're believing for God, be bold about it, Okay? Be bold about it. Put yourself out there. Keep trying. She was persistent. You know, first Jesus was silent. And then he told his disciples to ignore her. And then he kind of was a little curt to her when he talked to her, but she kept at it. She was persistent. She was humble. When, when, when God said, or Jesus said, you know, it's basically called her dog. She didn't fight it. She didn't, she didn't you know, argue that. She came with humility. And she was Christ-focused. She was Christ-focused. She kept calling him Lord. She kept calling him Lord. Her focus was on Jesus. She came, this this is why I keep seeing the the gospel in this, because she came with nothing. She came with absolutely nothing. She came with absolute nothing to offer Jesus. She's an illustration of the gospel. She could not stand before Jesus upon her own merit, could she? 
Neither can we. She had no inherent right to claim. She represented the sting of death and the object of God's wrath. She came without any plea other than the plea for mercy. And that's you and I. The gospel tells us that we can't stand before God on our own merit. We have no inherent right to claim the kingdom of God on our own. Without Christ, we stand before God as people of wrath. We have no plea to make other than to plead for mercy. And that is exactly how God wants it. See, the gospel makes little sense to those who are righteous in their own eyes. The gospel is offensive to those who won't admit to themselves that they are sinners in need of a savior. But that's who we are, and that's who Jesus is. The gospel is beautiful only to those whose hearts cry out against them and who cry for mercy. And when a person has nothing at all to offer to God other than their heart and the confession of faith, that will activate God's mercy into a saving action that transforms us from being his enemy to being his child. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Amen. Do you see the, do you see the gospel in this story? Oh, so do I. Why don't you pray with me? God, I just, I love the story, God. I love how it displays the, the mercy of Christ. I love the gospel. I love your word. I pray for every heart, God, that suffers under the weight of self-condemnation. I pray that they will understand that the poverty of our soul is the fertile ground for your grace. God, Lord, we stand empty-handed, bringing nothing to you but the plea for mercy and the shed blood of Christ that changes us from a child of scorn to a child of God. We love you, Lord. And we sing this song again, Lord, just as we are, without, uh, without a plea in the world, without a case in the world, Lord. Not enough money can impress you. Not enough righteous acts can impress you, Lord. We have to come empty-handed, full of all the baggage that the world carries. And if we confess who we are and confess who you are on a dime, God, you switch and you call us your child. What a beautiful message. We love you, Lord. Amen.